Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Frank Ackermann. I'm here to present information security in Plato's case. I'm focusing on uh, offshore development and outsourcing, which is a quite interesting topic since a couple of years, especially in Europe, where a couple of companies are thinking about giving away the IT to another company or other persons bringing up new services, new ideas to, let's say, establish new possibilities to engage money, to engage new work, to engage new companies. Just a disclaimer, this target does not contain any kind of uh, in-depth technical, techie, script, whatever stuff. It's more about security awareness, more about security architecture and management. And the second thing is, um, this talk does definitely not reflect um, the opinion of my employer or the former employers. <clears throat> Who I am? I'm working in security management consulting and architecture since a couple of years. I'm uh, working right now in Düsseldorf in Germany. Um, the address here to upload, if you would like to have some additional information or would like to have some uh, extra slides or the slides directly from me. Um, now let's start directly. Before I'm going to go into the topic of Plato and the thing is um, what is offshoring, what is outsourcing, what is the real definition about that. Offshoring is more the word about this power generator, water, um, windmills in the water thing, which means um, a couple of energy producing companies placing big windmills anywhere and where nobody lives or in the sea to get uh, power and these plants are out of their territory, they're sometimes in international waters and not directly belong to a certain country. Outsourcing is when you're thinking about to give away certain things out of your company or out of your environment to somebody else. And offshoring is especially when you're talking about buying in developers knowledge or development from other companies but not sitting in your house onshore which means they're sitting offshore. Plato and Plato's cave, it's a myth. It's an, uh, Plato wrote once a letter um, to a couple of friends and he summed up it's about having people in a cave. These people think that's their reality and um, they have to interpret, interpret the, the world and their reality, what the shadows are. Um, I've had contact with Plato's uh, allegory in the, uh, in the museum actually about shadows and shadow making things and uh, I was pretty impressed and I thought about well it would be a good possibility to explain what's actually happening when we're talking about outsourcing, when we're talking about the possibility to, to give things away to other companies. Before I'm going to um, explain it in detail what Plato's meaning and things, I found a very nice YouTube video which describes um, what is actually all about this and their uh, um, modeling, um, how's it called? Uh, modeling dough, uh, German word is Knete or Knetmasse, um, where people made a movie out of that. Just a minute. to experience the world outside of the cave for the very first time. And it is like nothing he could have ever imagined. With his new perception of the world, 
world. The man will of course want to return to his friends to share his incredible discoveries. But the prisoners cannot recognize their old friend. He appears as all things do. His voice is a distorted echo, and his body is a grotesque shadow. They cannot understand his fantastic stories of the world outside of the cave. To them, it will never exist. This, of course, does not make the world outside of the cave any less real. So, the intention to show this um, little movie was to give you more explanation, a uh, better explanation what actually Plato's Cave is and uh, which kind of viewpoints we have. Um, we're actually in the position right now that we have been in the real world and uh, we're staying in the cave. Why? Because um, when we're in the cave, and uh, the cave is actually the situation where we are because we're bringing things towards the light and we say, well, we're not in, in the real world anymore. Um, we chain ourselves in the cave. Um, was it kind of weird? I'll go into in detail now. We're in the very um, bottom of this little picture. We are in the cave. We know that there is a cave and we know that there is shadow. We see the shadows. In the second circle, there is, um, there is this object or things which actually cause the shadows and the fire itself. And there is the real world. The real world is actually when we're having IT and uh, our own IT and our own company. So we have a direct influence into this uh, what's actually happening about all the servers, all, all, all the applications, which kind of architecture we're having, which kind of processes we have behind that. But when we're thinking about outsourcing, we're pushing ourselves into a cave. We're pushing ourselves into a situation when somebody else is managing the real world and managing the, uh, the situation, which kind of reality we're going to be, be displayed. As I mentioned, we're Prisoners, when we're going to think about outsourcing, we're bringing somebody else in position to show somebody to make us something new, visible, which is actually happening or not. To change um, our, our interpretation of which should be implemented, talking about security, yes, talking about, for example, compliance, talking about policies, talking about controls, talking about internal control systems. The shadows, when we're sitting in the cave, the shadows are our understanding um, of what the things might be that must not be because, as uh, also shown in the shadow uh, in, the, in the movie itself, um, the shadows are kind of grotesque. The people sitting in the cave, sometimes knowing or not knowing what the real world is, um, just understand, yes, there is a shadow and something might be happening and they're going to try to understand what that would mean but without clearly defining what they really would like to or what they need to see to understand what's really happening in the level of fire or in the reality, um, it's absolutely non, not working. The objects, um, which are in uh, my picture in the second uh, layer, the objects are the thing where the outsourcer in that point is able to show and to um, describe what what, what kind of shadows should be um, displayed on the wall. Your supplier, your outsourcer, the person you're going to trust and bring over your IT is the person who produces the shadows. He has the artific, uh, artifacts, he has the objects in the hand and shows <coughs> it against the fire to, to cast a shadow. And you are actually the one who's, um, sorry, I missed kind of the red line. The person who is producing the shadow cannot, uh, cannot um, modify the, the fire itself, but he can modify how the objects are presented towards the fire to, pre uh, to create a shadow. And the fire, this is actually what we can uh, understand ourselves as compliance. The fire is, can be a rule set, a definition, can be a standard to say, well, we would like to see that in that and that way, we would like to have that and that kind of controls, we would like to have 
a constant reality in our living environment. Um, what does it mean in, in technically words or technical words? We have, for example, a SAS 70 report type one or two. When you're, for example, asking somebody to um, give you a SAS 70 report, you get an also very good understanding how the mitigations are, how the processes are, what, they, what the aspects are behind that. Or you have another, um, an ISO standard, 2007, 2001, whatever, to describe more or less in a very high level how um, you can implement compliance, implement security, implement security management. But what actually is done, it's not possible to see because you're not really directly in that. It's not, and you're not in your work anymore because you outsourced it. The real world, which is the upper level, where we have been till yet when your company, for example, is not outsourcing right now. You have the daylight, which is very straight when you know, you know when it's morning, mid and afternoon. Uh, you know that there are different kind of shadows, you know that can be different kind of colors. Everything is perfect. Speaking also technically, we have zero days attack. We have insider information uh, flowing away. We have information warfare companies attacking you, your company, your customers would like to steal information from you. We have vendor problems. Uh, you buy in hardware which might be vulnerable. You might have uh, external threats we were never thought about before. This is what actually happened in the out world, in the real world. But in the real world, there's also something like good, the good things. Um, somebody who is really understanding security, persons like you and me thinking about security all the time, thinking about the possibility to, to spread the words, to uh, make other people understanding what security, and, uh, security management, for example, is. When, like in a movie, we're coming out again, or we're being there, um, sometimes the daylight hurts. We know the reality is not sometimes very nice, but we also know that this could be real reality. So, bringing the allegory together with our little, well, topic. We have been outside, we know what the real world are. We know what kind of standards are possible. We know when we're driving our own IT, what we actually have the possibility to, to focus on. So, the next thing is we know that there are real objects, that there are real, a real fire, and there are certain things we can check, for example, doing internal controls, doing focusing on certain topics. We've seen that and we know that things are casting shadows. So when we're thinking now about offshore development, outsourcing, IT information things, um, and we're thinking also about outsourcing that giving away the things we had control in before, we're deep, deep in the cave. When we're in the cave, we do not have control on the fire, and we do not directly have control on the shadows. But the major difference between Plato and our example is when we're sitting in the, um, in the cave and uh, your outsourcer, in that case, the person very close to the fire is uh, casting the shadows, we are able to speak with them we're able to say, well, uh, please, uh, can you highlight certain things or please, can you produce that and that shadow because then we can believe that that and that, that's, uh, that, and that object or that and that rule or that, that and that implementation. Last but not least, we can't change the cave. When we're talking about offshoring and outsourcing, there are different types of things where what actually could happen and what I'm pretty sure a lot of companies do. A lot of companies do definitely outsourcing and types of consulting services, which means when you are limited on resources or you can't buy or hire employees on the market with specific know-how, you buy in consultancy. When you're thinking about using, for example, cloud services, um, it's quite interesting. We are talking about IT hosting only certain parts of your applications running, for example, anywhere but not on your side. You can outsource or you can offshore development, which means, for example, you're in a specific market, you have specific needs, you would like to have a real fast reaction on development. So you might think, well, I'm not hiring a lot of developers on my side, I would like to have just the resources ready when a project is starting. So what you can do is, for example, buy developers in India, buy developers anywhere in Europe, anywhere in South Africa or South America. 
So you just bring over the idea what to develop and you do all the development, the, the um, non-technical part on your side, describe what you really would like to have and then you ship it over and say, well, build me until that date, send me back your information um, or the binary. And you can source out parts of the IT or parts of the company. For example, project management is a good example um, where a lot of companies thinking about that they're splitting project management, which is absolutely possible work to, um, to outsource or to, to buy in consultancy. Um, by the way, you can also outsource HR because it's also not one of the base and core services your company normally has. Or you can buy out or sell out or outsource your complete IT, which means partnering. For example, when you're, when you're owning a bakery and you do a lot of very good brittles and breads and whatever, um, your, your core business is doing bakery stuff and not IT. So when you're thinking about, well, why not do some uh, online shop things for my, for my bread stuff and send it over, you can buy in uh, services for your IT transfer or services for um, shipping costs or online services or a combination between an online shop and a, and a delivery service. So what is the real reason to do that? Um, next to hidden agendas, which might be totally political, mostly it's getting rid of people, getting things um, away, certain non-core business or getting lost, last but not least, getting rid of the IT because IT sometimes is not very, really in focus. Even for example in financial environments, even for example in trading environments, the people are thinking, well, we're trading um, most of the applications based on IT. They're doing a lot of information um, uh, world processing on IT, but they're not thinking about that this is really their, one of their core aspects. Um, and also, last but not least, it's talking about money. Everybody I spoke with who does outsourcing or thought about outsourcing or offshoring or whatever um, managed to say, well, it's all about costs, we're saving costs, but it's definitely not. Because normally when you outsource, you uh, first have a lot, you should have uh, um, start a, a very big project to think about what you really would like to do. And the th next thing is sometimes it takes over one, two, three years to really outsource this part or the complete part of your IT. So um, when everybody says, well, we save a lot of costs, no way. The second is, um, it's like Rosie. Everybody talks about a return of security investment. Um, it's a nice topic, but nobody really established it in the company. So it's the same. This were already mentioned. Um, we have been outside, now we're inside, now we're going to try to interpret, interpret what the shadows are, what's actually happening. And um, what is the difference between the shadows in our new world, which means within the, case, uh, within the cave, or what is uh, the difference to the, to the real world itself, which means um, we know what we can control, we know what there is, we know what there was, and now we have to make, make a match. So, we're the ones in the cave. We know who's producing the shadows. We can change the situation, here we go. And that is what we actually have to do. We have to think about what do, which kind of world information do we need in our cave to, to regulate it, even when we're doing outsourcing. And then you can say, well, uh, might be a lot of things to do. Oh, yes, of course, we can use standards. Um, standards, industry standards, a lot of crazy, a lot of sometimes really good stuff popped up in the last couple of years and a lot of um, outsourcers also present. By the way, is anybody of you working for an outsourcer or an offshore service company? No. What a pity. SAS 70 report. It's a great opportunity to um, ask for. It's a great opportunity to show up to the auditors and say, well, we have a supplier already. We have somebody here in, uh, with a binding contract. You can show up a SAS 70 report. A SAS 70 report shows um, on in-depth security aspects nothing. The same like ISO 2001 or the implementation of ISO 2005. When you are certified, you are certified to certain audit aspects where the auditors of the audited company uh, thought about, have on their checklist. But in my opinion and what I experienced, there was so little yet that your certification 
does not really describe that this person is really sure. They have certain aspects implemented. They have very good ideas sometimes, or sometimes a very good uh, change management or incident <coughs> management or service management or whatever. But they're not, um, well, they might be as secure or more secure um, as, as you are have been for have you been before but um, the this kind of standards does not show that it's more or less comparable but you cannot say well we have two competitors we would like to challenge and both have the S70 report and an ISO one uh, ISO XYZ uh, certificate and license um, which of one is better you have to look in depth what's happening we have COVID standards, for example. We have ITIL standards. We have PCIDS Ash, which came up in the last couple of years, and which is pretty um, a pretty money-making thing. Um, next to the industry standards, you have a lot of baselines, governance aspects, which are coming up, policy-specific laws, policy-specific policy guidelines, development guidelines in the other company, uh, which might not be co um, comparable to your development guidelines before. Um, individual compliance checks, um, companies majority level, which means sometimes your majority level might not be the same, might be lower or higher than the majority level of the, of the company you buy in. Um, I experienced one time that an, a company outsourced uh, certain parts of IT and said, well, we do it with a, with a company in India. And then after around about a year of uh, challenging both sides, um, they realized that the majority level of the Indian company was much more higher and very specific and they had very good ideas for how to practice, how to uh, do processes, how to document and the company who actually ordered the stuff weren't able to compare it because the majority level was too low to understand what they really do. Surrounding of national laws, that's another aspect which is quite interesting. When you're doing business in Europe and you're doing business with companies in Europe, it's quite easy because you have the Euro uh, European law and European governments. Um, you have local national laws. But when you're talking about inter non-national or inter non-Europe connections towards Europe or towards, uh, for example, India, America, Russia, South Africa, it's quite interesting to get this all together, to get this, first, first of all, comparable, to um, really um, make it possible, for example, to transfer information. Um, well, also, for example, when there are certain encryption laws in place, for example, delivering information towards uh, France, towards China, towards US, might be interesting sometimes. Of course, you have language problems, for example, when you're having a French-speaking or German-speaking company who would like to outsource and they're thinking about outsourcing new things to Brazil or to India. Um, and not everybody in your own company uh, or the ordering company is uh, speaking English, so it might be sometimes quite interesting to get your work done you would like to go out or you would like to outsource. And additionally, you have cultural problems. Um, Coming back to the uh, industry standards, even when there is an industry standard and you're pretty described in, in detail, pretty precise, which kind of change management you would like to see, which kind of controls you would like to see, which kind of evidences you would like to have on the audits, even it's so precise, nobody really could under, misunderstand that. The description is coming from you, from, for example, European environment. When you bring this over to China, to India, to Brazil, to whatever, the people might understand what you mean, but might deliver different evidences, different aspects, which are not, let's say, matched directly to that what you really need. Risks and benefits. Um, when you say you would like to outsource, yes, you put yourself in a position. And then, then uh, you have to think about what is your really, what is your, definitely your real core business. And then you can say, well, I would like to do that because of certain things. And are there risks? Yes, there are. Um, and, and another thing I've learned that sometimes it's very uh, interesting to talk not about risks, more talk about challenges or talk about chances. So um, I try to bring that in later on, but uh, we should also talk about challenges, the chances. Um, 
while you're talking about this risk and benefit aspect, the confidence aspect is very interesting. When you say would like, you would like to give something away, for example, your wallet, with your complete money, which more or less can be, into, uh, can be your information, your holy grail, uh, you give it to somebody else, you can do more or less two things. You can trust him like it's your best bro, or you can say, well, I would like to control you. These are the both aspects you have. And um, the middle in between is more or less to accept, uh, accept the residual risks, which is mostly done in the business, which is mostly done in uh, risk controlled and uh, well, uh, risk pushed uh, environment, for example, in trading houses. That's their job. They're doing risk acceptance or they're, they're pushing risks to get more money. What are the real benefits on uh, doing outsourcing, doing uh, bring, let's say, your holy grail into another, another company? You're flexible. For example, the consultancy aspect, you're total flexible. When you run your complete projects or the complete project management, um, by a consultancy company, just by the resources, without any problem. When you say you here next week, they're in next week. You can um, extend and increase the possibility of knowledge. You can say, well, I would like to buy in, for example, security cons consultancy, and they have to train our administrators. Perfect. You can also increase your uh, your business, um, as I mentioned, this uh, transfer delivery, uh, delivery, uh, delivery and online shop thing. Um, the bakery is not able to implement IT as normal IT persons do. So they buy in the resources and say, well, other people can do it better. Here we go. What are the risks? The risks when we're talking about IT partnering, which means the total IT is away. You're giving away the IT heart, everything, all the service, all the services, all the applications, all the connections, all everything, away to another company. You might lose your data you might have the possibility to also lose control um, of the evidences, which means you don't have any evidences. So when the auditors at the, at the end of the year come up and say, well, please show me where your data is, and anywhere in the cloud at an IT partner, you don't have a clue, and this is what you have to say. You're losing also uh, the possibility of uh, influence your architecture. For example, then when you're outsourcing or you're uh, ordering um, IT by another uh, company, you normally say, I would like to have web services, but you're not having a possibility to discuss, well, I would like to have that, and that kind of product, that, and that kind of version. I would like to have a, a I prefer, for example, a WebSphere or Tomcat or uh, not IS, whatever. And there's a risk that your IT partner, which might have different or um, certain clients, they might blend your information, which mix it up. For example, when they're not segregating the databases where store, your data is stored, um, sometimes it happens, I've heard, that data is mixed up. Um, when you are sourcing out parts of your IT, for example, application management only or other services, you might lose also company data. You might also lose knowledge of the application or, um, for example, when, you lose, uh, when you're sourcing out project management only. Um, you might also lose knowledge of how the project management works or lose uh, knowledge of um, the application itself or the business knowledge. Sometimes it's also very important to have direct contact into the business, which is internally more possible than more externally. As I mentioned, support uh, and consulting can be outsourced, which means also that you have the risk on knowledge uh, can be lost or knowledge is transferred and um, that, the re that the results which are produced for your side is reused. Um, last but not least, when you're also having consultancy into your company or you directly outsource certain things to consultancy, um, you might have risks in the integrity or confidentiality because a lot of uh, data exchange is not possible um, with a secured line or the, the, the consultancy company is not so big, they're having a big, big guy uh, in backbone, they're having not a secure uh, mailing services, there's no possibility to, to, um, to uh, send your data around. Major and big issues when you're doing development um, and you're outsourcing the complete development, you have the 
the great, let's say, uh, issue to think about local admin rights and the special development equipment which is actually happening. When developers are in your house or developing offshore, they would like to have extended rights to really, really, really implement uh, in depth to install certain software. When you're sitting in there in your house, which means to open your environment, asking somebody else developing for you, you don't have a clue what's actually running on, on their machines or on your machines by them having extended rights. Malicious code in your source code or in the binary might be a problem. You don't have a clue what's actually happening there unless you control it. Open source um, code and closed software, uh, source code, <coughs> sorry, open source code and closed source code is a quite interesting aspect also for licensing, which means, for example, when you ask certain developers to develop things for you to, to uh, well, to find solutions and they just copy and paste open source aspects which you can't directly regulate what, because they're outsourced, um, you get a license problem because then you're breaking open source license uh, and then you might also break other licenses which are directly linked to that. Um, or which is also doing the consultancy way, uh, re you, reuse of code snippets which means, um, for example, you're in a trading business and you uh, would like to get a development for a certain method to create a forecast which is very important for your business. When you use this um, method in an, another, let's say, environment, like let's say your competitor, he might reuse this as uh, his model. And then there are, it, the, the competitor is having, let's say, um, more, um, more information that you have. That's another aspect. And one very interesting thing is uh, <laughs> testing data. Um, I've heard that um, a lot of developers are not really, let's say, happy when they're having anonymized uh, information, which means data which is not real um, productive data. So they would like to have direct access to the production to get real productive data, test, not only test data. Or when they're using test data and something goes wrong then in production, then they're saying or complaining, well, um, we didn't have real production data to test it. Maybe it's uh, now possible to do that and that and that. But you're still shipping over, especially when the developers are sitting offside, you're shipping, shipping over um, the test data and your production data anywhere else. Um, data exchange were interesting when they're sitting uh, offshore and at onshore. Um, <coughs> virtual environment is quite interesting. Um, sometimes you don't have a direct access when they're using virtual environment. Uh, intellectual property and cop copyright aspects might be very interesting and um, sometimes subcontractor sub aspects are coming in which means um, that you're offshoring and this person is also offshoring. For example, you ask somebody in India to do something and um, they're organizing developers which are quite cheaper than, their, than themselves from uh, Pakistan. Last but not least, you're the owner of your data, you're the owner of your business and you have to think about what you really would like to shift over. So. We have to mitigate, yes. We have to know the risks, yes. And I have only 10 minutes, yes. Um, first mitigation, strategy, strategy, strategy. I can't repeat it often, more often. It's, um, it's so important to first think about what you really would like to do, to first think about what you would like to achieve. What is the thing, what you really would like to do concerning your business, what you would like to do with your IT? What is the IT strategy behind it? And then afterwards, what is your really IT information strategy? know what to order and not only do a handshake on the golf course. Information security aspects, classify, it's also standard, it's nothing new. Classify your data, classify your information workflow, classify your business, know what you really have, know what your really assets are, know the holy grail. Then you can de describe what your really access controls are, what you really need. This is what I mentioned with the fire shadow thing. When you know what you're, not, what you're having, and you know what you expect, you have, can directly, very in-depth, concrete, describe what you want. Overthink your controls. Sometimes uh, companies implement internal control systems, which are quite good, and um, they have a lot of things to cover, but um, sometimes the, the, descri the description of the control is so, let's say, um, not detailed, that the, the evidences which are created are not usable only for auditors to say, well, it's done, but that's all. Audit and compliance, the same thing. Um, think about your security guideline. Think about what you, 
again, think about what you really would like to have, think about what your strategy is, and then describe it in a security guideline. And this security guideline should be also cover um, the ODCs, and the ODCs should understand what you, what you need and should sign that off. Um, Define also the way of incident handling, which is one of the biggest pro uh, one, is one of the major problems which are uh, which are happening. The people are having incident management processes, which are quite good. But when something is happening with your data, you might, for example, get only uh, once a month an information about that because this is written in the policy or this is written in the contract. This is quite easy. Um, think about segregating networks. Think about segregation. Uh, Duties um, define information flow and exchange possibilities and uh, overthink your entries, which means, um, for example, working with a consultancy company, think about exchanging data um, securely. Law and regulation. Um, before you start and before you really start, um, think what you want <laughs> again, strategy, and then write in a request for proposal and, and do security there not do have, let's say, a nice, uh, well, we do promise to do that later, but it's not in a request for proposal. When you're in security and you have the possibility to, to develop and inject security in request for proposal, do it, it's quite important. And revise and think about your sourcing strategy, which, which leads directly your, the, the, the um, contractual flaw of the complete um, outsourcing aspect. When you would like to buy in, for example, development companies or uh, smaller one or two man shows for certain developments which are very specific, describe that in a contract, very concrete, know what you would like to have. And then the second thing is describe what your sourcing strategy is. For example, if something's happening wrong, do you would like to get rid of this? Do you would like to get rid of this person or the company or not? Uh, also, which should be in your uh, contract and which should not be negotiable is intellectual property rights, copyright, um, copyrights, um, the law aspects, data pro protection law. For example, data protection law in Europe is quite strong compared to, to other regions. Penalty aspects, if something's happening wrong, you should charge certain pieces, persons. Development and architecture, it's the same. Virtualization, it's quite interesting because a lot of companies work with virtualization. When you would like to do that, think about that before you realize that. The same with the local admin rights. Um, who can help? This is quite an interesting stuff. Um, when you're thinking about doing the outsourcing and think about, well, uh, I'm not really in, in the best position to discuss that or not, um, well, I would like to buy somebody in to organize me the outsourcing. Um, why not do that? I said, well, it's not possible. Nobody's offering that. It is theirs. I found one example of a uh, company. They're offering um, outsourcing for outsourcing. Um, best is just to uh, have a closer look at the internet side, which kind of service they offer, and they're doing everything. You don't have to think about. Um, this brings you into position in the old, old world. In the um, Plato's real world thing, you have um, business orders IT, which means um, the IT is directly, when you're in the business, directly in your charge, you have directly access to it. The new situation would be the outsourcer there, and your IT is doing kind of demand management. So the business is talking to IT, and the IT as the demand manager is pushing that over to the outsourcer or the partner, whatever. And this supported situation is quite interesting um, that your Business is ordering your IT. The IT is doing something together with the outsourcing service, and the outsourcing service is directly demand managing the outsourcer. I think this helps really good. Um, another thing is, by the way, uh, ramp up services are offered, but nobody is thinking about shutting that down, which means everybody's saying, well, we're pushing that over, but nobody's pushing that back. Conclusion. Last but not least, strategy, think about what you want. Think about what you need. Think about which kind of business you have, and which, what you actually would like to uh, contractual bind, what you really would like to do with it. You know what the real world looks like, so think about do you would like to return to the fire, which means do you would like to um, engage yourself in discussion with the ODC and um, think about what the real shadows are, or do you would like to stay in the cave and be chained and ex accept everything which happens coming from the from the upper light anywhere. 
um, order um, what you what you need, order the evidences you would like to have, order um, sometimes concrete audits on site, which means when you're not trusting that person, go over and ask, look for it, and be sure you're in the right location. For example, you're flying over uproad to any country and ask your supporter, well, could you please show us around? And they're showing you a very shiny building, which looks great. The logo is on the, on the company's uh, house. The housing is great. The security on site is great. Everything looks perfect. Everybody's dressed up perfect. Everybody's so shiny. Then you fly back and have, let's say, a kind of weird feeling in your stomach because it was too clean. Um, maybe you should think over if you were in the right environment. Um, to stay in the cave, you have to do some efforts. You have to do something, and you have to think about it before. And um, you have to, uh, do to do comprehensive analysis before that, not during that. I've seen a lot of projects where um, offshore, offshoring, IT partnering, outsourcing were happening, and nobody thought about before that. They directly thought about starting with the project because it came from the senior management. I would like to thank you for your interest. I would like to thanks for uh, DeepSec organization and invitation. And if you have any questions, feel free. Yeah, or the worst case? Maybe both. If oh. you <laughs> um, the worst case sounds funnier. Um, the worst case I've heard from was shipping over productive data by a delivering service, like um, postal, parcel service, whatever, and the complete package the complete bundle of data stored on, uh, I think it was um, uh, German words, Magnetbänder, um, ma magnet tapes, um, was lost away. Not encrypted, not nothing, and everybody said, well, it's not too good, but well, um, happens. And um, Afterwards, everybody said, "Well, it was, but it was important because the developer would, li would like to have to have to, uh, to have the productive environment, or would like to have a copy of the productive environment." That was not too good. Um, most common is, I think, uh, to buy in developers because you don't get the enough knowledge on the market sometimes for specific environments or for specific uh, development. But this, for example, SAP um, development, when you're having very good ABBA programmers, they're not working in your company, they're working for a consultancy company because they're earning, earning double or twice what you can pay. So you buy in for a certain project, for example, an ABBA programmer, but he knows much more on SAP and everything on ABBA you, know, you ever could know. So what might happen is that he can um, think of changing code or let's say think of the problems you have in your roles and rights model in the SAP and might get um, let's say uh, this information left on the table at the competitor side. So uh, this might be one of the um, let's say quite critical and um, interesting situation. Thank you. Okay, thanks so, so much.